Hi, my name's Jeff Butler. I want to thank you for taking the time to view this Fresnel Zone Calculation Tool wireless tutorial. In this tutorial, I'm going to show you how the Fresnel Zone defines the propagation of a signal from transmitter to receiver and how it also defines the diffractive effect of objects in the path of the signal. We'll then go on to show you how to use the Fresnel Zone Calculation Tool to characterize these effects for a reliable wireless system design. Okay, now let's define the Fresnel Zone. The Fresnel Zone, has an important thing to understand first, is that the, the propagation of a waveform is not a pinpoint wave shape, as would be defined by this black line from transmitter to receiver. Rather, it's a parabolic or elliptical waveform shown by this gray area here. The shape of the Fresnel Zone and size of the Fresnel Zone is defined by its radius r. There are only two variables that define radius r the first of which is the frequency f of the transmit signal, the second of which is the distance d between the transmitter and the receiver. If we look below our diagram, we see these two equations which define the radius r of the Fresnel zone. In the first equation, we define the radius r in terms of meters. The equation on the right will allow us to define the radius r of the Fresnel zone in terms of feet. A more closer inspection of the equation shows us that the frequency of the signal appears in the denominator of the equation. Therefore, an increase in, in f or increase in frequency of signal results in a decrease of the size of the length of the radius of the Fresnel zone. So in essence, a higher frequency signal will have a smaller radius r or narrower Fresnel zone, and a lower frequency signal will have a larger radius r or larger Fresnel zone. It's also important to understand that these are the only variables, the frequency of the signal, of the transmitted signal, and the d distance between the, the antennas are the only variables that affect radius r. So therefore, if you increase the gain of the antenna or decrease the antenna beam width, that, those effects will have no effect on the shape of the Fresnel zone from transmitter to receiver. Therefore, they will have no effect on overcoming any objects in the path of the Fresnel zone. Now let's look at what characterizes a clear Fresnel zone. If we look at our diagram here, this outer parabola is the F1 Fresnel zone with radius r as calculated from our previous equations. This inner parabola is known as the 0.6 F1 or 60% Fresnel zone, which is also termed the diffraction loss zone. It is the 6 tenth Fresnel zone, the 60% of the actual Fresnel zone that must remain clear of obstruction to avoid any diffraction of the signal as it transmits from point A antenna to the receive antenna at point B. If we look at our building here in the example, although it does impact the first or across the first Fresnel zone F1, it does not encroach upon the 0.6 Fresnel zone or the diffraction loss zone here defined in the inner parabola. Therefore, the propagation of signal from transmitter A to receiver B will have no will be not unaffected by this building in the center. So we have a clear Fresnel zone in this instance. Now let's look at our design example. If you've taken the time to look at our link budget calculation tool, this design example will look familiar to you. What we have is a drone deployment with a link distance between the ground control station and the drone of five kilometers the hovering height of a drone for surveillance purposes of 55 meters, the height of the ground controller, approximately 1.5 meters above the ground. We do have some obstructions in the path. We have a tree line that does appear here, and it appears it starts at 1.6 kilometers from the ground control station and extends to about 2.6 kilometers, again, in reference to the ground control station. The height of the trees maxima is maximally 10 meters, worst case. We're going to determine between two potential operating frequencies, which of which would be best for our design. We're going to choose between 2.4 gigahertz or 915 megahertz. Again, based on our calculations, we'll determine which of these two frequencies would be best suited for our design. Now let's take all these parameters and enter them into our Fresnel Zone Design Calculation Tool and see what results we get. Okay, to start our, our Fresnel Zone Calculation, we'll start with the link calculation portion of the spreadsheet located at the lower left-hand corner a lower left tab. As we indicated earlier, there are only two variables that we're concerned about. 
uh, for the calculation of the Fresnel zone, the first variable of which is, is the frequency of operation of the signal. So if we go to our drop-down menu here, uh, and our radios, our nomenclature indicates the frequency, and we're going to start with our 915 megahertz radio to start. Let's indicate that. And the second variable is the link distance between the transmit and receive antennas. In our case, that's going to be kilometers and five kilometers. It's under that. Okay, now, now let's go on and look at end of the path profile data for our particular design example. And we'll do that in terms of kilometers. So let's go to the fourth tab here, profile data in kilometers, enter that. And now let's run through the entry, the entry selections here. The first one we see here is atmospheric refractivity coefficient, or K. This atmospheric refractivity coefficient, K, is basically a factor of how the atmospheric conditions at your link location affect the bending or refraction of your signal. The default value for normal atmospheric conditions is 1.33, or K factor of 1.33. A key thing to understand is atmospheric refractivity really only affects signals of, of, or links longer than 7 miles in distance. Or so in that case, since our link is only 5 kilometers, this isn't really a factor. In longer links, such as ones that are greater than 7 miles in distance, this factor will basically define for you what design you have to implement in terms of spatial diversity configuration for your antennas. But again, since we are only looking at a link that's under 5 kilometers, this factor doesn't have a play in, the, in, our, in, our, in our scenario, so we'll leave it as the, at its default value of 1.33, so a K factor of 1.33 default, leaving that alone. If it had to be changed, you can change it here in, our, in, our, in a pull-down menu, but in our instance, we'll leave it in, in a default factor. The other variable for the tabulation of our spreadsheet is the Fresnel zone reference number. Now, in our case, since we're just looking at Fresnel zone obstruction, path obstruction, the Fresnel zone reference number should be left at zero. It should be placed at zero. If we were interested in, in multiple Fresnel zones and looking at multipath reflections, then we'd enter an odd number here, one, three, or five. But since we're only interested in the first Fresnel zone, for path obstruction purposes, we'll enter the Fresnel zone number of zero. Now, the, uh, the next calculation cell here is basically the frequency. This basically transitions over as part of the auto population from our previous link calculation spreadsheet, and it's 0.915 gigahertz or 915 megahertz, as we defined it. The path length also, also po auto po the path length also auto populates, and that's at five kilometers, which we defined again in the link calculator sheet previously. Now we have to look at what's the local site elevation in terms of meters above sea level. Presuming our, 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 for our case in our design example, we're at, we're at sea level, we'll leave this at zero. The next is the local antenna height in terms of meters above ground. 